All right, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. I see people are coming in. So, um, hi, my name is Robin Brenner and I am the teen librarian at the Public Library of Brookline. And I'm here uh, presenting today in my role as part of the Massachusetts Library Association Program Planners section. And I am the chair of the teen subcommittee of that section and the main uh, point of the program planners is to champion and advance um, program planning statewide in Massachusetts and uh, therefore doing things like providing educational opportunities like this where we can all share with each other the successes and, and sometimes failures of our programming and also to think through the tools and best practices that everyone can use. And so we are here today to do a teen showcase, and that will be showing off some programs that each of the three of us are going to talk through. And unfortunately, one of our panelists today was unable to make it today, Amy. Um, she was um, unfortunately taken sick this morning. So it'll just be the three of us um, that will leave some time for more questions. So um, if you need to ask any questions, I'm going to ask that you ask them towards the end. Um, we do have the Q&A set up, so all the questions can come in through the Q&A on Zoom. And then otherwise, we are going to present in order and um, we'll go through the presentations first and then hopefully have some time for discussion at the end. Um, the one other thing I did want to bring up for everyone's information is that there will be another showcase like this coming up on Thursday, March 16th at 1 p.m. That is for children's programming. And I know a lot of us do a lot of crossover. So that will be STEAM programs for children. And I will send out the registration link for that when I send out the follow-up email email to this showcase and I'm sure it'll be advertised across all the platforms as well in the same way that this one was um, but we'll make sure to send out that link so if you're interested in attending that one you can as well and then for today I'm going to be presenting first myself and and then we'll go through um, with Tori and Katie and for today I'm actually presenting I had not originally not intended to present but I was um, hoping we could have our tween librarian here in Brookline present Abby Stevens um, but just due to scheduling she wasn't able to do it today so I'm kind of doing it on her behalf um, so I'm going to go ahead and get going so let me just get my presentation ready hold on just a second so here is our just our opening slide but today, what I'm going to talk about most is um, working on our MUG program. So we have done a lot of different programs over the years with tweens and teens, and Abby and I work together all the time. So we are kind of in the same office, and we constantly are bouncing our programs back and forth off each other. So we're trying to make sure that we do programs together. Um, and Abby is one of the few, as you know, tween librarians in the state. That's a, a newer thing of having a whole section and having a dedicated staff person. Um, so I know a lot of people were interested in the idea of what do you do with tweens? There's a rising demand for tween programming and tween collections. So I was hoping to address that today. And uh, all of our contact information will also be at the end. Um, so one thing I wanted to first bring up is that this program came about partially because we already have a makerspace, which we call our idea space, and it has a dedicated room with dedicated tools and all kinds of different making equipment. And for a number of months, I'd say ever since we re reopened um, and also generally during the pandemic, we did a lot of kits that involved making. So we decided once we reopened and we're doing in-person programs, we wanted to do one program a month that was dedicated for teens or tweens and that they were um, using the idea space, you know, expressly giving them access to some of the bigger tools that you don't get to use as easily. Um, for example, we have a Glowforge laser cutter that you kind of, it's not something you can take home, but a lot of people really want to be able to use it. Um, so we've done a bunch of different programs and we're always trying to figure out the best balance between what tweens can handle, what teens can handle, and also not overwhelming ourselves with the planning. Um, so that's the kind of we do it together in the sense that we plan the program together, but we do actually present the programs differently. Um, so one program will start for tweens, and then the next hour will be for teens. And that's partially because we discovered that tweens and teens don't want to hang out together. Um, when we've tried to do programs together, they feel awkward around each other, or they feel intimidated. For example, the tweens will feel intimidated by the older teens, and the older teens will feel weird about being in a program with a nine-year-old or 10-year-old. Um, so that's kind of uh, 
the reason we decided to do two separate programs, as well as, of course, giving everyone the chance to use the materials and tools that we have. And for just to define it for Brookline, tween is fifth grade to seventh grade and teen is eighth grade to twelfth grade. Um, so just to be upfront about the costs, um, if you don't already have a makerspace and don't already have the tools, then this would be the full cost for the beginning of the program. Um, but if you do want to continue doing similar programs, then it'll cost a lot less because it's just the supplies to use. So the, the mug press is uh, about $200. Um, we always look for sales. Honestly, there's a lot of Cricut sales through other places, either Cricut itself or through um, stores like Michael's or um, Joann's. There's like, oh, just keep your eye out and you'll find some decent deals. Um, but those top items are all things that can be reused, so you don't have to constantly be spending this much money. The mugs are the thing that will obviously go through faster. Um, and we already had the Cricut mug press as part of our makerspace, so that didn't involve us paying too much more for just that. But we hadn't used it yet, so we had to figure out how to use it. And we wanted to make sure we thought through the process for tweens, especially, um, and to make it as easy as possible for them to do something fun. So uh, as you can see, this isn't cheap in terms of the whole cost, but in the long run, I think it's not too expensive a program if you kind of make it clear that you can use the mug press over time. Um, so one of the things I immediately learned is that when we were investigating how to use this mug press, it uses infusible ink. So that's how it fuses the design into the blank of the mug. You can use it for all kinds of different objects. Um, we're out going to do one in the future that's actually coasters that work the same way. Um, but one of the things about the Cricut is, of course, that it's also a cutting plotting machine. And you can cut out a design with Cricut on infusible ink sheets that you can then use to infuse onto the mug. Um, however, However, we found that took way too long and was just a complicated process, especially involving a lot of fine motor skills and picking out all the empty space of a design. So for comparison there, I did two pretty complicated ones because I'm me and I always do complicated designs. But that first one took about an hour for me to just draw and write. And then the second one was about three hours because I was just constantly having to pick out all the design elements. Um, and we knew that would be frustrating. So we just decided, let's not. Um, and so keeping it with the markers means you can choose different mugs, um, sorry, different colors and give them some different ideas of what they look like. Uh, one thing we did also learn is to give them color um, marker samples so they can see the colors and make sure that it makes sense to them. So for running the, this particular program, we do run them for an hour. And you can do it with one person, but it's usually better with two. Um, as if any of you work with tweens, you know, they get very excited and rambunctious about things like this. And I know that the first time we opened up the door, they, um, Abby had about 50 tweens come flooding in. And that's how she learned that she should have made it a ticketed event. Um, and she ended up having to take the first 25 and then cut it off at the door, um, which is a bummer for the tweens who were hopeful to get something. But of course, we also told them we'd do it again. Um, so I think if you are doing it for tweens, make sure it's either a registration or that you hand out tickets to make sure that you don't overwhelm yourself and give the tweens the best experience they can have. And then the other thing about this program is that you'll want to advertise in advance the time and date for them to pick up the mugs because they won't be all be able to take them home that day. You might be able to make a few, but not all of them. And then this is the mug press. Um, as you can see, that little slot to the left is how you put the mug inside the heating element. And that little flap on the right side is how you press it down to kind of squeeze in on the mug and make sure that the design is being pressed. Um, but just to give you a sense of how it works, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes for the, the press itself to just heat up um, so that it's ready to do a design. Um, setting up the mug design takes about five minutes. I'll show you a little more detail later. And then you actually doing the heat press um, the actual heating part of it takes about four to five minutes. It's not actually that long, but the longer part is actually waiting for the mug to cool down. And you do have to wait for that. It gets very hot inside the press. And especially with tweens or teens, you don't want them to um, be touching the mugs because they'll burn themselves. So just be careful about that and think that through as well. 
Um, so the way we kind of did it the day of is that we started on the hour showing them the very basics of how to do it, the different kinds of designs they could do. Um, both of us did a demo with one mug, so we could it was already set up and already ready, and when we stuck it in the mug press and then could pull it out and show the kids later how it worked. Um, in our case, we have a template that I'll show you, and we gave them the template and give them only pencils first to encourage them to sketch their design before they make a permanent design. Um, as you know, a lot of teens and tweens get very excited, and then they kind of realize they've made a mistake and have to start over. Um, so you want to, you know, lessen the frustration as much as you can. And then you add in the markers and the pens and make sure that they have different ones. In this case, the markers are a little bit thicker of a nib, so they make a thicker line, and the pens are much more micro sort of line, and they're different colors. So you you can decide how much you want to do the different varieties. And then towards the end of the hour, just remind everyone when they can pick up their mugs to make sure they understand. Um, in our case, we had kids going in and out all the time because once they finished their design, they would run back to the tween room or the teen room and then come back in to check on what everyone else was doing. So it was a little bit of mayhem, but that's just the way it works. Um, and then I always advise only make one mug, as I said, and this mug we actually did specifically so that we could show all the colors of the markers. So the little snake on the bottom is all of the fine point markers and then the top ones were all the um, markers that were the thicker points. And then um, as you'll spy, it's a little tricky to do writing well. So I'll talk about that. This is our template, and this will be available in the uh, Google Drive folder that we'll share at the end that has all, all of our resources in it. Um, and we figured out pretty quickly the easiest way to do this is to give them a few instructions on the sheet, but mainly you just want to show where they should draw and where it will appear on the mug. So you can see little pink mugs there show you where the design will show up. And then at the top, we made the little name, phone, and email so that we could cut that out at the end and stick it in the mug so that everybody can see which mug is which design, because um, as you make them lose track. So that was very, we started to realize we really needed to do that. And then the other thing is to definitely make extra copies, because I, ha I had one team that went through about seven different designs, because they kept trying to write and then kept messing up, and then just would be like, can I have another one? <laughs> and you'd be like, sure. Um, so you want to make sure they have enough time. And then, as you can say, we use just plain old copy paper. You don't need fancy paper for this. And actually, the, the kind of thinner paper, the better in terms of how smooth it is. That works better. Um, you can sketch out the design with pencil and erase things and then ink all the lines with the markers. I think one thing we learned is a lot of the tweens and teens didn't understand that the markers are the thing that transferred the design. So they would think the pencil lines would go through, but they don't. Um, so you might need to remind them like, oh, you'll need to ink over that or else it won't show up. Um, and then you can just use the different markers and pens for different kinds of marks and colors. And then, as I said, writing is really tricky. That top mug is an example of a, a teen who was rushing and didn't think about the fact that it would be reversed on the mug. Um, so you have to reverse both the letters and the words, and that really threw people. They could figure out how to reverse the letters, but then would end up writing still from left to right, and therefore they kept having to kind of redo it. I did make some stencils that helps people, so you can literally flip the stencil and trace the letters, and that helped a little bit, but it was also a little tricky. So if you had a little more time, you might want to make um, individual stencils for the kids to help them, but I think that's a little complicated for an hour program. Um, so if you're doing this with just tweens, I might honestly just say, tell them not to use any words. It's just going to be too complicated. Um, and then at the end of the program, you roll up the sheet, stick it in the mug, and then you know how many mugs you're making, as well as you have all the designs with a mug, so you know you're all set. Um, once you actually do it, um, the kids can cut it out themselves, but I, in the long run, I decided it's easier to just cut it out yourself because then you still have all the information from the sheet. Um, and as you can see, you can use the heat resistant tape there to make sure that the design is really staying flush against the edges of the mug. And um, the design goes in first, and then you just hold, uh, put another layer of one sheet of copy paper that you've folded three times over just to give it a buffer. Um, and that will get a little bit singed, but that's okay. That's the point of it is to protect the, both the design and the mug from the heat of the press. Um, and then you have the little slip there at the bottom. And so that really helps a lot. And then, as I said, you have to give it time. So each mug you make will take at least 15 minutes to cool down. So I honestly did it during an evening shift where I had three hours where I just sat there and like made mugs, you know, for the whole time um, to get through all the ones we had. 
and we had about um, overall about 45 mugs that we made that one day for both groups. Um, and then as you can see, you take the little sheet and you stick it in the mug once it's made, and then you've got all the different mugs together and you still know whose is whose. Um, obviously the kids will recognize their mugs, but you wanna make sure that you know, just in case a parent comes in who doesn't know what the mug looked like and doesn't know whose it's gonna be. Um, so yeah, that's the very basics of the program. And as you can see, these are all examples of the mugs the kids did. Um, they're all delightful. It was wonderful to see all the different designs and they were very cute um, from the littler ones to the more sophisticated ones that some of the teens did. And some of them spent like the full hour just designing the mug very carefully. Um, so you can see how um, detailed some of them could get. Um, but yeah, so this is mine for um, uh, the mug program. I feel like I've gone very fast, as, it, as is my way, I speak too quickly. Um, but as I said, we'll get to questions towards the end. And then now we will move on to Tori's presentation. Yay. Um, so my name is Tori Gelman. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and I'm the teen services and maker space librarian at Ventress Memorial Library down in Marshfield, Mass. Um, and I'm going to talk about a, I guess, non-traditional program in a way. Um, it's sort of like a project slash involving teens program, um, but we'll get into it. So um, I've called this Every Teen Feeling Seen. It's part of a grant that we received to um, bolster our print materials. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about having, you know, having a designated space for teens within the library is only one step towards the larger goal of making sure teens have ownership over their physical space um, and their material offerings within the library. So after receiving this grant to, to, you know, increase our physical collection, make it better, I knew that I wanted my teens actively involved in the process of selecting the new print materials that reflected their diverse and unique identities. Um, it was already a goal of mine to conduct a diversity audit um, during the um, library's closure, we had a carpeting replacement done. It took about two months um, and we were all working from home. And I thought, what better way to work from home than to fill out an absolutely massive spreadsheet. Um, and it kept me really connected with the teens because as I'll talk about, they they participated in the audit. Um, so uh, it dovetailed really nicely that way. Um, some people really wanted to convince me that um, it wasn't gonna be successful having teens participate in conducting a diversity audit, um, but it was a really wonderful learning opportunity for me and them, I think, and it helped foster community within our teen volunteers. Um, I initially put out a call to our teen leaders group, we call them the TVs, and uh, explained the project and was able to put together a five member teen committee, which is a pretty good portion size given our, our um, community population. And they helped to create the diversity audit criteria, um, looked at resources, assessed titles currently in the collection, and then after we completed the audit, which like I said took around two months, um, the committee analyzed our data and we made strategic and evidence-based choices about which titles to prioritize in purchasing with the grant money and then on a larger scale going forward. So um, next slide, please. Um, so before I get into the logistics of the audit project, I wanted to note that a huge factor in acquiring and promoting diverse titles for young readers is the publishing industry um, and the trends in publishing at large. So um, this is the most current kind of reputable data I could find. So according to the Cooperative Children's Book Center's 2019 survey on diversity in children's and YA books, nearly 42% of the approximately 3,700 books surveyed featured white protagonists. Um, and then I put that chart on the right because I found it really interesting and quite sad that the second largest identified category is animals slash other. Um, and I bring this up just because I think it's important to look at um, the YA literature landscape um, and realize that selecting and elevating diverse titles, authors, stories, it has to be a very intentional practice. Um, so next slide, please. Um, this is just a really sparse, brief outline of um, our process for conducting the audit. So step one, I guess step 0 0.5 was getting the grant money. And then step one was to develop our audit criteria, um, which lo included looking at our community demographics, um, census data, community assessments. We're in the middle of conducting a long range plan. So that just sort of all worked out nicely and that we had data coming in that we could use. Um, and then talking to the teens, um, these are just some ways I recommend getting to know your community from a numbers standpoint mainly. And then having the teen committee of volunteers on board throughout the whole process um, helped fill in the gaps where mere numbers could not. Um, 
the teens are the ones interacting with other teens on a daily basis. I know we try to get into schools and, and partner with community organizations, but at the end of the day, I think having that teen input is, is critical in anything that we're trying to do. Um, so, and publicly available data also is a great starting point, but nothing beats, you know, firsthand knowledge and experiences of your community members. Um, so our next step was filling out our extensive audit spreadsheet, which you will see a very small screen grab of in a minute. Um, and everything after everything was filled out, we looked at trends within our collection and moved on to purchasing and actually weeding recommendations, um, all of which I will talk about more in a minute. So next slide. Um, so the bas basic purpose of a diversity audit is to assess the content within your print materials. Um, that's like a very, very basic way of explaining it. Um, for this project, we look specifically at our YA fiction collection. Um, the YA is broken up into fiction, and then we've got graphic novels and manga kind of in one bracket, and then our nonfiction separately. Um, it's all the same budget, but that's just kind of how it's arranged given our space. Um, I, I really hope to replicate this with our graphic novels and manga at some point in the future. I think it would be really interesting, to, and nonfiction. I just think graphic novels and manga in particular would be very interesting to look at. Um, so using criteria other librarians have tracked, we did not reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, they, I found through sources like School Library Journal, they have a lot of great articles um, about past diversity audits that have been conducted. Um, and then we, uh, myself and the team committee, we added some more distinct elements to look for based on our community um, and the input of the committee. Uh, so then we had the spreadsheet that we could all collaborate on. And just to give an example of a criteria we added, um, and I'll talk about criteria also in a little bit, but um, we felt it was important to distinguish between books that had representation of the Holocaust and books that had Jewish representation outside of the Holocaust. Um, so in our religious, you know, brick of, of the spreadsheet, that was something that we made note of, and that's just one of several examples. Um, another one is in sci-fi, a lot of characters um, are described as, you know, brown, or there's a color to their skin, but their ethnicity or or race isn't, like, explicitly stated. So we had VB for vague brown on the category. Um, for lack of a better way to describe it, that was sort of a teen um, notion that they came up with. So those are just some examples. Um, and uh, to assess titles, we looked at, you know, Kirkus reviews, um, Goodreads tags and comments, novelist, and then we used personal experiences. If we've read the book, you know, use what you know. Um, uh, it's a very tedious process um, filling out a giant diversity audit like that. And um, with less time, we would have done, you know, a sampling. But since we were, I was home for two months, I was like, I'm going to do the whole thing. And that was probably a bit too ambitious. But I did end up doing all, you know, 1500 books in the fiction collection. So and it, it's helpful because then you get a much clearer um, picture of everything. Um, and I will admit that when it came time to actually dig into the audit, teen participation dwindled quite a bit, which is totally fine. I kind of expected that. Um, but I do, I still completely champion having them involved and, and knowing about the project, knowing what's going on and, and having that sort of background, because then, as I'll talk about again in a minute, um, when it came time for purchasing books, recommending titles, looking into where they could find, you know, divert more diverse titles, uh, they got really excited again. So it was sort of a beginning, middle dwindled off, but end they came back. So um, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Oh, I, I wanted to note also that this is not a perfect system. No diversity audit ever is. Um, some books may represent a community, but do so in a harmful or offensive way. Um, putting checks, as in, checks in boxes is never going to tell you everything about a book or a collection, but the point is to get kind of an overarching picture of what you're currently working with um, and what you can do to make your collection more diverse and representative of the community in the world. So um, next slide, please. Um, so this is some of our uh, criteria. Um, again, you'll see the spreadsheet on the next slide, but for authors and book characters, we had two separate categories for those like overarching um, headers. And then we looked at race, sex, gender, sexual orientation, disability rep, religion. And then we had a little, you know, box at the end for miscellaneous things that needed to be noted, but didn't necessarily warrant like their own column. Um, the genre and the publisher thing came about after we'd done, I don't know, probably about 40 books or so. Um, the teens were kind of interested in what genres maybe lent themselves more to diversity. I don't know exactly how to word that, but like maybe there was a genre that happened to be more diverse than others. Um, they were just kind of curious and genres are obviously totally subjective. So um, that's kind of a grain of salt, but that's something we looked at. And then for publishers, we wanted to look at if there were any publishers that were, you know, really doing an outstanding job of 
of publishing diverse um, representative titles. And then a note on series, um, we grouped series together. So they were kind of like chunked in blocks of color, but we did individually look at each book within the series because as is the case with, I don't know, like Shadow and Bone, Lee Bardugo, um, the series gets progressively more diverse and kind of like grows um, as it goes on. So we wanted to um, account for that. So the next slide, please. Um, I talked a little bit about our evaluation tools. Um, we we looked at Kirkus. They have really great book, like little snapshot book reviews, um, and they make a really big point about diversity elements. Um, so that can be a really like easy kind of quick way to get an idea of a book. Goodreads um, is has its has its faults, but um, it also it's community tags. So you're learning from people outside of necessarily you know people marketing for the book. Um, the author of the book, you're seeing what people who have read the book have to say about it, and you can kind of sift through those comments and those those tags. Um, and then personal experience, like I said, and to throw a cat picture in there, because who doesn't love a, a good cat picture? Um, and then on the next slide, I think, is my very small, yeah, so that's, I, it's minuscule, and I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to get all of the things um, on the top there. Um, so on the left-hand column, you'll see kind of our bib our bib metadata over there. So it's like title, author, we did publisher, um, publication year. I also added a column um, for target age because we do have some, I guess, technically middle grade books in the YA, there's crossover. And then we have a few adult titles, whether that be like a, a required reading for school or something that a teen requested that I think works well in the teen section. So that's on that side. And then our the pink in the middle there is um, all of our author data. Then we go on to the characters within the book with race, uh, kind of all those things I listed before. And then towards the end is our miscellaneous and genre categories. Um, so the next part, disappointed but not surprised. Um, so our results were somewhat expected and kind of highlighted identities and experiences that our collection was missing. Um, I, I sort of, from what I've seen from other diversity audits, this is the trend. Um, and again, that goes back to both publishing trends, librarianship, historical practices, all sorts of things. Um, but I wanted to pull out a few of our statistics. So 71% of authors were white and the next highest was um, Asian American Pacific Islander at 12.2%. Um, and then 78% of authors were women, which I actually then went back and looked, and that's extremely, you know, with the trends in publishing for young adults. Um, nearly 60% of our book characters were white, whereas less than 1% were Indigenous or Native American, and our religious diversity, queer rep, and disability rep were all lacking as well, um, which seems like discouraging results, but actually it's great because it highlights um, all, well, it's not great. It, it, it highlights room for greatness and to grow. Um, so the post-audit period is where my teens really got to shine because they had these book lists, awards, resources to look at and see diverse titles, and they were able to discuss and advocate for acquisitions of specific books, and we had data to back up our choices and money with which to purchase these books. So about 50% of the books I've purchased so far with the grant money, we still have quite a bit left, but um, about half of the books purchased have been recommended by the teens, which I think is just, that's great. That was like the whole point um, for me. So um, we've looked at honor awards lists. Um, actually, would you go to the next slide, please, before I there we go. Um, so we've looked at honor awards lists like Sydney Taylor, Stonewall, Schneider Family, Pierre Belpre, um, sites like We Need Diverse Books, which has great lists and resources specifically for things like this. Um, and then just my, my last note there is that if a teen asks me to buy a book, like in regards to this or outwise, I, I buy it unless it's like horribly problematic or there's we we have it and it's out or something like that. But if a teen requests a book, I think getting it is a very simple and cool way to show that you're listening, you care, and you really want the space to be buy-in for the teens. Um, and then I was just going to mention too that um, space is at a premium um, in our libraries. I'm sure is true for many. Um, our teen room was actually built in. It's, you know, like plastic plexiglass walls. Um, it was built in with a grant in 2019. Um, and it's, it's very small. It's great. It's cozy, but it's very small. So um, anything that makes weeding and using that space appropriately easier is a thing that I'm all for. Um, and this was really helpful with that as well, kind of looking at, okay, what's circling, what's not, what what can we maybe part with, what do we need to make sure to hold on to? Um, and, you know, with the basic criteria, depending on your library still applying of, you know, date, condition, all that kind of stuff. But um, 
yeah, it was just a helpful tool at the end. So um, the last slide is just a little thank you. And like I said at the beginning, I know this isn't at all a traditional program. Um, I sort of missed the brief, but I hope it was interesting anyway. Um, and uh, it's not really a traditional way to conduct a diversity audit, as I saw, but I really wanted to highlight how including teens and typically, you know, like behind the scenes library procedures can be a great way to further um, their sense of autonomy and authority over their space and the collection. So thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about helping teens help their communities. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I'm Katie Nelson. I'm the head of teen services at the Beverly Public Library. And I've been in this position for about, this will be my third summer reading. <laughs> so um, we'll count my summer readings as a teen librarian, which means I'm relatively new and I started during the pandemic. So it was kind of, um, all new to me when I started having teens in person. Um, so next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why I do want to volunteering programming and um, specifically our downtown cleanup program, which is like the flagship of our volunteering and then some other options that you can do in other volunteering programs that have worked for us and then partnerships and tips for doing it yourself. So next slide. Um, so what if, why would I do one-off volunteering programs? Um, the biggest thing was I get contacted a lot. I get a lot of teens that ask, are looking for volunteer hours. They're looking to volunteer at the library. Um, but we have a limited number of volunteering positions. So normally our volunteers work on shelving or doing the pull list. Um, but there's only so much that can be done in a day. The other thing is, and this is our library only, so I don't know how other libraries do it, but we have our volunteer, everybody who volunteers, even teens have to be quarried. Um, so it's a kind of a complicated process and we don't want someone just doing like one hour because it's a big process to um, get them quarried and, and you know apply for the program and everything. So when we do, when we have people looking for one, off volunteer options um, or people that were calling and saying, hey, do you guys have any volunteering at the library? It became apparent that we needed something a little bit more, um, you know, simple. Um, and it was also easier for the teens to commit to. They're not committing to an hour a week or to, um, you know, coming every month, once a month. Um, they can just come when they're able. And also means that there are teens that don't necessarily see our programming um, or, you know, and things like that, and you reach a new audience with this. And finally, this is um, just a fortunate <laughs> um, outcome as well, is that it looks really good to the community. You're phys you physically are out there having teens pick up trash in this case, um, and the community sees that and they appreciate um, it. And I'm always getting, I'm getting complimented when it's really the teens doing all the work. <laughs> so, um, so next slide. So it all started with a beach cleanup. We, I was asked um, to do a program for Climate Preparedness Week in September of 2021. And so we are a beachside community. And so I scheduled a beach cleanup on in September um, on our beach called Dane Street Beach, which is downtown, um, but not close to the library. So if you go to the next slide, I learned a couple things. <laughs> First, I had to change the date, which um, I think really impacted attendance. It, it made it a little more challenging. We had some weather that day. Um, and we actually didn't find that much trash, which seems kind of crazy. But it turns out that in Beverly Beaches get the most focus on cleanups. Um, and so we were finding that when there's a community cleanup, it's the beach. You know, people say, let's go clean up down. Dane Street Beach or um, Independence Beach. And so there just wasn't that much trash. They did spend a lot of time like picking up tiny little microplastics, which is great. And I love it. But, um, you know, that it was, I think they really started getting fine grain with it to excuse the pun. Um, and then because it was challenging weather, we had to hurry up to reschedule it. It's really hard when you're doing an outdoor program, especially in the fall and winter to, or the fall to, um, you know, rely on the weather in New England. And then also I did have to coordinate with uh, the custodians to pick up the bags of trash at the beach and it was a little complicated. Um, so I, if we were gonna go to the next slide, 
um, that kind of all led to downtown cleanup, which I had noticed I was starting to see, actually, like now that I was looking, I was seeing a lot more trash downtown and, and around the library itself. Luckily, we're conveniently located um, just a block away from one of our main streets and right near a park, and there's actually a cemetery in the area too. Um, so we're located pretty centrally downtown and there's a lot of trash downtown. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, I created Downtown Cleanup, which is a monthly cleanup from March to December. Um, and it's from 3.30 to five. And basically I promote it with pizza and volunteer hours to clean up the city. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is kind of the nitty gritty. So basically I provide trash bags and I provide smaller ones so that they can fill them up and then the custodians put them in one large one. Um, plastic gloves and I always have sanitizer and wipes. And then I also order pizza. So I have the custodi custodians set up a table outside of the library for us. Um, and then when the teens show up, they get sent off with a trash bag and a pair of gloves. And I tell them to come back in about an hour, around 4.45ish. Um, and they, then I order pizza and I just get it delivered right to the library. Um, and I usually do Domino's. I'm very bad at pizza math. So there's always extra pizza, <laughs> which the teens love. So that's fine. And then um, the custodians take the trash and luckily we do it on Tuesdays. So our trash day is Wednesday. So it actually works out really perfectly. Um, but so the, I, you know, have the ball put the trash in one area and then um, the custodians take care of it for us. And our custodians are fantastic and awesome. Um, so that's always helpful to have too. Um, so next slide. So these are some numbers. Oh, I didn't know that was animated. <laughs> um, these are some numbers. You can see that it varies a little bit. And unfortunately in this summer, July, August, and September, it was like raining every day. We wanted to do downtown cleanup. So we did have to cancel it for, um, for those months, but you can see we get some good numbers, um, a little bit of variety. I don't know what happened in April, but um, the rest of the time we get some good turnout and um, some good attendance. So next slide. And then these are my fantastic teens from different programs doing some downtown cleanup. And you can see the embarrassing amount of trash they collect um, over in that bottom corner. Um, so next slide. So after seeing the success of this program, I did realize that there's opportunities for other volunteering programs. Um, so I kind of took that and went with it. So next slide. So last February, we decided to do a drop-in program um, with Valentine's Day card making. So basically I put out the, the supplies and um, made it drop in on Saturday and Sunday. So it's two days and they could just come and make cards if they wanted to and um, the, the cards were collected and I dropped them off at the Council of Aging and they passed it out. And so we had 10 attendees which over the two days, which was a great, um, great numbers for that program, especially because we didn't put it in any newsletter or anything. We just posted on social media that we would be doing the drop, the pop-ins uh, or pop-ups. So next slide. And then in December, um, we did something similar, but this one a little differently. Unfortunately, I got sick, so I was out. But it's a very easy program, so I had a coworker run it for me. Um, and though it was lower attendance, um, they did make a bunch of really nice cards. And again, they were dropped off at the Council on Aging. Um, and so while I was planning this program, I was talking to the Council on Aging, making sure the timing worked to drop them off and everything. Um, we decided to actually partner with them for the next program. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, we ended up partnering with the Council on Aging, which is pretty close to the uh, to the middle school, um, but also downtown on an intergenerational programming. Um, so it was at the Council on Aging, and we promoted this in our newsletter and with community partners. And basically, I bought some cookies, and that's all the money I spent on this program. Um, and as we all know about teens, I could have bought more cookies, and it would have been no problem. <laughs> Um, but we used a lot of supplies we already had. So I raided the children's room for craft paper and heart shaped stuff. And, um, you know, I have a collection of glue with scissors and scrapbooking stuff and, you know, all that kind of stuff you have around. Um, and I gathered it up. And so if you go to the next slide, 
it turned out the ratio of teens to seniors was a little off, but we had 30 teens come and um, four seniors. Um, but they had a great time. They made a whole bunch of cards and the cards were gonna be passed out later at a Valentine's Day program um, that the Senior Center was gonna be having. And we're already in the process of talking about planning one for spring of 2023. So actually the next couple months. Um, you know, another card making program. It's a very simple program because you already have a lot of the supplies. You have markers and glue and craft paper. Um, or if not, it's not a high investment to purchase that stuff and you can reuse it a lot. Um, and food, they, we had to go scrounging for more food at the senior center. Luckily they had, um, you know, a big box of uh, Cheez-Its, I think. Um, so, you know, food is always a plus. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, we're planning on it again. So if we go to the next slide, and you can actually keep going. So um, there were a couple different partnerships that we worked on with this. So we had the groups that really helped spread the word, which was the National Honor Society and the National Junior Honor Society. Tapping into those groups was fantastic because they're always looking for volunteer hours. And then I actually got an email from the school's major at the ROTC. And he was like, how do I like, Prove, how did they prove they came to the program? And I was like, they take a picture? I mean, I, <laughs> I was like, I'll sign whatever form you need. Um, so he also, you know, was looking for volunteer hours for his students. Um, and so they were able to, you know, come to the downtown cleanup and stuff. We also partnered with some teens and DECA on one of their programs. They wanted to do a downtown cleanup. And so they partnered with us. Um, and then, like I talked about, the Council on Aging was, um, a big help and a big addition. Um, so next slide, and this is a filler slide, go ahead and skip to the next one. Um, so these are kind of my tips for doing this yourself and giving your own chance. Um, so first of all, you look for the people that are looking for community service, they're out there and they want it. You probably are already getting approached. Um, and a lot of the supplies we already had, we had trash bags, you know, we have trash bags, we have gloves, we have sanitizer, we have cardstock. Um, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but food, food is like a big, huge motivator. Tell them you love pizza or tell them you love cookies or whatever, and they'll be there. One of the big things I found was that rescheduling really doesn't work. Um, in this case, especially for the cleanups at least, because even if you were scheduled, you can't guarantee the weather's gonna be good. Um, and it gets confusing for them. So having it regularly scheduled, having it ever once a month on Tuesday, um, I think I do the second Tuesday, it's like, okay, sorry, we can't do it this month because it's snowing out or it's raining out, um, but we'll do it, you know, it'll be next month. You know, the, it'll continue to happen. Um, I do pause in uh, January and February. So we'll be resuming in March of this year. Um, and there's always trash to pick up. I mean, unfortunately, it's a, a constant problem. Um, and then it also, it looks good. Let passerbys know what you're doing. When I sit out, I sit outside the whole time while they're out cleaning up. And so people are always like, oh, what's going on? Do we need to check in or whatever? And so I'm chatting with them about um, the fact that we have teens out cleaning the community. Um, and it, it looks really good and they love to see it. And um, it also means you get to talk to everyone instead of just <laughs> out there. Um, so I think I talked really fast and I'm sorry, but looks like we're good on time anyway. So last slide is just my contact information. Um, and so I think we're gonna pass it back to, pass it back to Robin for questions. First, I just wanted to make sure everyone saw this. Um, these are all the slides and downloadables that we have. Um, I know, for example, for mine, you have the mug template and things like that. They're all in this um, web address, and I will also email it out after the presentation, and you can scan that QR code and it should take you to the right place. Um, so there's multiple ways to get there and to get all the details. Um, and then uh, I will share our contact information as well um, at the end. But first I figured I'd just give us all a chance to answer some questions. Um, you have a question either send it in the Q&A or uh, go ahead and um, see if you want to raise your hand, then I can also um, invite you to speak as well if you'd like. Robin, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that the cups need to cool. Do they cool mm -hmm. in, in 
in the machine or outside? No, the um, sure. That's a, a good question. Um, there's like a one of the things I have listed in the things you buy is like a heat mat. And honestly, you could probably just use a cookie sheet. I don't know that you need a fancy mat, but um, but we had it, so I used it. Um, but yeah, you do need to take it out of the machine and then you just set it down. You can you can touch the handle of the mug because it's it doesn't go inside the heating part of the press. Um, but then I just would stick it on the heat mat. And what I did is it's a relatively small heat mat. It's like this big, I wanna say it's like 12 by 12. Um, so I could do like nine at a time and I would stick the sheet of paper under the edge of the mat for each mug. So again, to kind of keep track of which mug was which person's. And then as they cooled down, I'd stick the sheet back in the mug and put it back in our little supply. Um, but yes, there's a lot of, um, just making sure nothing catches on fire. I'm famous for lighting things on fire with the Glowforge at my library. So, um, so I try not to do that as much as I can. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's one of the basics for that. The one thing I did want to mention, by the way, is that um, Amy had originally been presenting on taste tests and um, I have run a ton of taste tests, so I can't, I, I don't know that I can do it off the top of my head, um, but we will definitely invite Amy back to talk about that at a, a future showcase so that we make sure we cover that in the future. Um, I know taste tests are super popular. Food is always popular, as we've all discussed. Um, so uh, so that's a kind of no-brainer for a program, um, but I think people do it in different ways, and I'm curious to hear how different libraries have done it. Um, but yeah, if anyone else has a question, we have about nine minutes. Um, I see, okay, we're getting them. Um, so one question for all of us is how do you promote your teen programs to get kids in the door? Um, I will say, honestly, word of mouth is always fastest with my teens and most important um, because they just tell each other that it's cool and then you get a whole bunch more teens. Um, we do a lot of doing programs as close to our rooms as possible. So we're lucky that our idea space is right next door to both the teen and tween rooms. So once a few teens come in, they can go back out and tell their friends when they come back. Um, when we do things, for example, on our second floor, that is less likely to happen. The teens are less likely to go upstairs. Um, so we try to make sure that we do that. Um, and uh, I'll let the rest of you answer that question as well. I can go with that. Um, so I have a lot of, I've really worked on building a network of like partners to share that information with. So I, you know, it goes out to the school, it goes out to the city, it goes out to the um, the um, city social media, it goes out to the parks and rec department. I really have built up kind of my monthly, here's what's going on at the library list. Um, and so that's worked, but also um, reaching out to like PTOs and stuff like that. I share a lot with them. Um, but like you said, it's getting teens excited about the program and word of mouth is huge. It, it can't be overstated. Um, but also I think the the volunteer time, like volunteer credit was really big for this program in particular. I know it's like not, you can't offer it for every program, um, but for this one in particular, that really is a draw because they're looking, they're looking for volunteer hours. Um, and so being able to say, yeah, actually, I do have a volunteer hour for you. Come clean up downtown is a really great um, promotion for the program. Yeah, ditto. Um, I email all my events to the, the middle and high school. Um, we just have one of each. And uh, the, I flyer the entire library. People get really sick of seeing my flyers, but they're everywhere. Um, yeah, and I have like a teen newsletter that's for like the teens and their parents if they want to, and that's a monthly thing. So I, and with that comes an email list. So if you have anything like on the flyer, you need to, we had like a reservation with a one of games over the summer that had to like move the day before it was supposed to happen. Um, so I feel you on that, Katie, it's, it's really hard. Um, but having that kind of like built in communication like you have is, is good too. So I don't have anything revolutionary to add. Uh, one more note on that that I will say is that we do uh, use Remind in my library 
library to send out text reminders and that works much better with teens than any other way of communicating. They don't read their email. Most of them don't know their own emails. Um, so I just have given up on trying to get to them that way, but we do have a newsletter and we have social media and all those things. So if we catch their parents, that might alert them to the fact that there's a program. Um, but for the teens themselves, either texting or um, getting those reminders, and then also just, as I said, word of mouth. Um, just to be clear, we also get a ton of tweens and teens in our library every day. So it's easier for us to just pull the kids in from the room. Um, just looking through some of the questions very quickly, I just wanted, someone asked if you can use cheap Dollar Tree mugs for the mug program. And unfortunately, no, you can't. Um, the mugs are treated with a, a thing that makes the ink stay and kind of absorb into the surface of the monk. They're called infusible blanks, and there are a lot of different kinds of them. You can find potentially ones that are not Cricut brand um, that, that will be cheaper, and just make sure to double test them before you get, you know, 100 mugs or whatever, um, because they may or may not work well with the Cricut. Um, but for example, in the future, we'd like to do water bottles, which is another thing you can do with the mug press. You just have to make sure that it works. Um, but we think, for example, for the summer, that would be really great to do in, um, custom water bottles for the teens and tweens. Um, and then, oh, and this is a question for you, Katie. Um, are your teens usually in a group when they go out for downtown cleanup? And do you ever have teens showing up solo or do you use like a buddy system when they're out? Um, so that is a great question because it's both. Um, so we do have some teens that show up with their friends and go out and they'll share a bag or they'll, you know, work together. And then, um, we have some teens that go out on their own. I don't assign them buddies or anything like that because our downtown's not huge, um, and they can't really go that far. Um, and some just want to walk around. Someone ended up you know, having their mom join them and the two of them went off together. Um, you could do a buddy system, but I just kind of, they show up at different times. So I just send them out of, as soon as they show up um, with their bags and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, I don't ever have them like join up, but I, I don't see why you couldn't if they, you know, want to make friends and stuff. A lot of the times they show up in groups. Um, so it's not that common that someone shows up on their own. Um, so I hope that answered everything. Um, I just had a couple of follow-ups on the mugs. Um, so one is for the heat. Do you have to get waivers signed by the kids or the parents? We don't, um, or at least we didn't. And again, mainly that was because they weren't anywhere near it. We just one demonstration at the beginning of the program. So we don't actually have the heated up mugs around the kids. Um, we do that ourselves later. And I honestly, I think that's why we also decided to do them after the programs. There's also the time, but it is very hot and you do not want kids to grab a mug and burn their hand. So we just decided to not risk that <laughs> in the actual making of the program. Um, I see there's also a question about the text remind software we use it's called remind and i believe it's literally remind.com and it is something that's used by schools uh, a lot of the time our high school and just generally the schools in brookline use it so it's a way to send text messages out kind of en masse but it means that no one has to give you their phone number and you don't have to give them your phone number. You can run it entirely online. You don't have a, have a phone. Um, and the kids do have to sign up for it. You have to opt in. So it's not like you're going to mass text people without their permission. Um, but we found it especially useful for all of our youth programs. We do it all the time for parents as well. Um, and especially if there's an emergency situation, like we have to close the library and there is no story time. We don't want people with small children having to trek into the snow only to find that we're closed. Um, so we we make sure to use it for that as well if there's anything major happening um which has been really useful uh, i'm just uh, someone's asking how do you encourage them to sign up we have a sign that literally has qr codes for all the different ones we have because we have teens tweens and kids um and we usually use one specifically for summer reading actually because that's a whole you know giant program unto itself um and it just it depends. Um, honestly, the other thing I've, I've been starting to consider right now is setting up a Discord um, that will just be a general Discord for the teens to hang out in, in a virtual space that's also the library. Um, but that will also be a way to spread the word for programs, because a lot of my teens have actually asked us to start a Discord. Um, and Discord is like a group forum 
that's used previously was used for gaming, but I think a lot of people got used to it over the last few years. Um, and then it's something that a lot of the teens definitely use. So that's another another possibility out there. <laughs> um, uh, we only have like one more minute, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, go to the, the last slide here. Um, so the next one is, this is just all of our information. Um, as I said, Amy, we will invite back from Sharon to present on the taste test programs. Um, and someone asked what those were. That's basically just having a taste test where you debate and or judge the taste quality of various things. Um, I have done them, for example, for potato chips of all different flavors. We've done Kit Kats of all different flavors, especially if you can get some from outside of the US. You can get all sorts of interesting flavors. Um, and this last one we did potato chips versus Pop-Tarts. So we had a whole range. Um, so now that I know people are interested, I'll make sure we do that next time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is all of us. Um, and as I said, all the information is also in the Google Drive. Um, all the slides will be there as well. So you'll be able to find all of us. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for attending and uh, thank everyone for speaking today. Thank you both for, for coming and sharing all your different programs. I think we had a really great variety and I learned a lot from hearing what you all are doing. Um, one final thing again is the reminder for the STEAM program for Children Showcase, which is coming up on Thursday, March 16th at 1 p.m. And also just to remind you that we do have a regular meeting for the teen program planners that happens once a month on the last Tuesday of the month at the same time, 10 in the morning. Um, so everyone's invited to come to that. You can register for that at, um, I'll send that out as well with the link for the email, for the post event email. But um, anyway, thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great rest of the day. <laughs>